Uh, welcome to Teachers Seeking Teachers. It is January 29th, uh, 2014, and um, we're going to figure out what um, Dave Cormier is up to. That's uh, where we're going to start. Um, and we're also, <laughs> she's, she's shaking his head, um, and Joanna is joining us, which is great. Um, we have um, our own rhythmatic learning that we, we also want to touch upon. We'll see if it just kind of comes up. Um, where Joe and Chris Sloan have been listing, their students have been listing topics to kind of pull together um, and uh, try to figure something out. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of that. We're going to let this go wherever it goes. Um, but uh, I asked a few people um, what would be a really cool thing to talk about this week. And uh, a couple of people independently uh, said, well, Dave Cormier has got something going on over there for the last few weeks at PDPU um, called RISO 14, and so we thought we'd invite you to let us know what you're doing, um, if that makes some sense. Uh, with us, we have Christina Cantrell, Fred Mindlin, um, I already mentioned Joe Aparicio, um, and Terry Elliott is with us as well, and Chris Sloan. Um, and there is room. Anybody wants to jump in? Yeah, and you're hearing this, you can find the link to jump in here at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Um, there's a link there on TitanPad. You can just join us. Um, so, Dave, over to you. <laughs> nice one. That's, a, <laughs> that's an awesome segue. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so uh, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to actually do an open course on Rhizomatic Learning. Um, and as Terry and I have discussed online, um, Usually, people go into this with a lot more support than I've gone into this one. <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's been fun. You know, I, I I wanted to talk about rhizomatic learning. I've been talking about it online, essentially by myself and at conferences and stuff for years. But the problem with getting up in front of a bunch of people and talking about your work is that, as much as it would be nice to interact with those people, and as much as I've really wanted to sort of engage with that you don't really get it at the conference. And as much as in my classrooms, I do my very, very best to allow that to happen. It's a face-to-face -face classroom. At the end of the day, I've got a grade I'm giving these people. So you're not really getting it back in the same way. So I thought, you know what I want to do? I want to open this up and get, like, just invite whoever wants to come and see what happens. Almost like an open course on the internet. Um, and so I did. And I figured, you know, we get, a, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 people. I think we got about 400 signed up at P2PU, so I so, called the... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, let, let's jump in right there. You, um, some, some language you just used there. Almost an open course. Uh, why, why the almost? And why a course? And is this a moo or not? A MOOC, sorry. A MOOC. Is, it is a moo, no. Sorry, is it a MOOC or not? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, okay. the guy who coined that term is a bit of a wingnut anyway. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> And the, the truth is, is when the term was coined, there was a whole bunch of other things going on, and it wasn't attached to the, the sort of media market machine that, that took it up in, in 2011, 2012. Um, is it a MOOC to me in the same way that we were doing MOOCs in 2008, 09, and, and 10? Absolutely it is. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's, it's done for the same reasons, using leveraging the same things that the internet can do, leveraging abundance, leveraging connectivity, leveraging the decentralization and the ability of different communities to form independently and all those great things that can happen. Totally it is. Is it in the way that the word is used now? I don't know anymore. Um, who is master, right? I feel like I feel like I'm having this, I said this to Audrey Waters the other night, I feel like I'm having this never-ending debate with Humpty Dumpty and he's sitting up there and telling me what MOOC means and I go, but, but it doesn't mean that. And it's been going on for six years now, so... Um, but you you must have pretty. I I did sift through s most of your introductory materials, and you were pretty careful not to use the word. I, I didn't to, um, <laughs> because again, it's it's not descriptive in the way that I would like it to be. Um, if it meant the same thing it meant five years ago, I would have used it because it it meant things to other people. Now, when you use the word, all you're doing is starting an argument. And the wonderful thing about this course and about the people who are in it is that they're all coming at this from their own perspectives. And I didn't want to set a tone that was about, um, that would set some people off and start that debate about whether it's a MOOC or whether it's an open course, because I'm in kind of a peculiar position around that word. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm accused of coining it in 2008. 
Um, so I didn't want the open course about my work, about stuff I really care about, to become about this word. Um, so I dodged it entirely. Uh, chickened out, you might call it. Are you um, writing about it too? Or researching around MOOCs yourself too? Uh, well, I mean, this is I was saying in the, in the chat room earlier, there's some stuff I haven't talked about uh, publicly yet that I'll talk about tonight. I'm doing a research project with edX right now. Mm -hmm. uh, working with some profs at MIT, trying to find a way to blend together some of both um, and trying to do some, um, you might call it bridging course or transitions course between high school and university for a couple of different STEM projects. Um, both because of the work that I'm doing at my university and because I think that there's a real gap there. And I think that it's one of the places where the MOOC model can be really powerful, particularly the adaptive learning model that comes out of the XMOOC stuff. So while I don't think that having a piece of software that grades you and tells you what's right is particularly valuable at the top end, I think for a lot of people who are in positions where they don't have access to a lot of educators with a lot of time, places, particularly in that summer period between those people who are actually trying to make the leap into university, we're talking about physics first, uh, certainly the students I see who come in the door, because I'm also responsible Which is for... why it's a leap into the university, so... Well, you're right. Um, <laughs> for a lot of them, it is, because mm -hmm. I'm also responsible. I manage the department responsible for first-year advisement and first-year success at the university, um, and a lot of those students come in the door totally lost without the thing, the links that they need. So one of the things that I'm hoping to do is leverage that X MOOC, that, that sort of technological MOOC, infrastructure to give them some of the foundational things that they need in order to be able to understand what's being forced upon them in some of those first-year science classes. Not because I necessarily like the way first-year science is being taught, but because that's the gateway to that profession. And I think that we can leverage some of that MOOC stuff and, and do some research around how to do that that can do a better job of giving particularly those people without access to fancy tutors and stuff one place that they can go to help prepare a little bit better to make that 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 leap in. So I'm doing some research in that sense. Um, but um, in terms of the one I'm running, running, being run on me is more likely. I don't know how much running I'm doing of RISO 14. Uh, there's an awful lot of good personalities in there. Um, but not not formal research per se. I, I don't I don't think it would make much sense to do so. I'm being transparent about it. I've asked some questions and posted those, the answers to them. Uh, I'm reflecting openly about them, so I guess I'm researching in a way that I think is important, but not in a formal academic sense. So others jump in um, as we go here. Terry, could I ask you to speak up on um, what was mentioned right at the beginning about, you know, more preparation or whatever <laughs> others have used? I mean, I, I just do think of the CMOOC that the Writing Project and others mess around with, and there was a lot, a lot of, like, pre-planning and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, yeah, we did a... I mean, there's a, Christina, she can talk about the stuff we did before May, and there was a lot of that that I'm not even aware of. And there's a whole back end that, you know, people like, uh, like Jordan Lusink and Lou Kakama took care of as far as preparing... Uh, but May was, you know, seemed like one hangout after another for the whole month, and uh, <laughs> and what we ended up with, I think, was something that was not, uh, you know, was not nailed down as far as what we were going to do. Right, a, each week it was something new that was it was coming up, uh, but there was an awful lot. We had an awful lot of support uh, uh, from NWP and. Uh, great facilitators, and uh, and in a way, I, you know what what uh, you're doing, Dave, is is brave as hell <laughs> because you don't have that support. But you know you've got you've got a different kind of support, mm -hmm. uh, and I think what you're doing is you're testing the notion that you can have this uh, uh, this future. You know, <laughs> they say the future yeah. is not. Uh, is the future is here, but it's just not evenly distributed. But I think it is evenly distributed in in RISO 14, and uh, people would, people take up the slack. And I, honestly, there's too much there for for me most of the time. You know, teaching teaching five classes this semester and and trying to actually take some of the things that I feel rhizomatic learning is and turning it into rhizomatic pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I admit I really don't know what the hell I'm doing, but <laughs> not anybody else. Uh, but yeah, we had an awful lot of, of preparation time, and in a way, I think uh, I think Dave mentioned that maybe shortening the course to four weeks in the survey. You said something about that, and I think I responded in the survey that might be you know maybe that'd be a good thing, kind of turn it headless, just like uh, yeah. PS 106 was this fall. That's right. I, I don't know. I mean, it's I think it'd be a, a really brave thing to try to do. Maybe foolhardy, <laughs> <laughs> but that hasn't stopped you. <laughs> no, we're already in for foolhardy at this point. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> I really Fred felt Midland. Like, Go ahead, yeah. I felt like the the CL MOOC this this summer, connected learning. First of all, the connected learning term is so uh, perfect as a marketing pitch that captures <laughs> something so much better than the clunky words we've been using for all these decades, those of us who wanted to do it that way. The key thing for me was that it was formally from the beginning not a course but a collaboration. And that's the change that rescued it from any MOOC this, MOOC that. It was collaborative and it was truly collaborative and it continues. To me, I feel like it's still going on. I, I check it every day, just about. You know, so it's a it's a wonderful that was a wonderful experience, and I just hope that continues into all of these efforts that um, that that feed from the same respect for everyone's voice and encouragement and and uh, feedback in a in a level and a depth that was just astounding. I, I so appreciate it to all of you. I just wanted to jump there you go. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, a couple of things. I guess um, it's funny. Well, the collaborative part, I just should say, is uh, was inspired by Mozilla, actually, because they, right before we did the Connected Learning MOOC, ran a Teach the Web um, open online event that they also called a massive open online collaboration. And we really liked that frame. So we took it, <laughs> or they call it, they didn't call it Mozilla, they call it Mozilla's Open Online Collaboration, sorry. <laughs> um, and then um, I guess just interestingly, Dave, we did want to celebrate MOOC, like we use MOOC very, um, you know, very proudly, <laughs> and we really wanted to celebrate that um, and kind of reclaim it, too it felt like the right way to describe what we were trying to do, you know, sure. very literally. <laughs> and um, so that was kind of fun. And then in terms of, um, I'm cu really curious to hear how the PTPU thing is going and also how headless events happen, because I haven't really participated in those. But um, I do think that the um, one of the strengths of CL MOOC there was a lot of support, but I, but you know, that planning, we all started that planning together pretty much, Terry, <laughs> and in May. And one of the things that I try to tease out is, is the one thing that Paul and I brought to it was sort of, um, That's Paul O, by the way. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, Paul O. Was to sort of approach the team of facilitators and ask you all to facilitate. And then also we went to a team of advisors, so that includes we looked um, to content from Dave that we knew online, as well as Paul Allison, and you know, so we we sort of gathered up what we knew about constructivist MOOCs and who knew about constructivist MOOCs and who'd been designing this work and constructivist um, uh, pedagogy for a while, and sort of brought you all together. So. Then everything unfolded from there, which I thought was just beautiful to watch. Um, but for me, the sort of the skills that you all brought into the room and the diversity of skills that you all brought into the room, the space <laughs> that we created together, feels like a really important piece of the puzzle to me. Um, and I'm still trying to just sort of figure out like how that all fits together and what it means for the future and all that. Any thoughts? <laughs> I, I think that I get the same. I'm getting the same feel from Rise 014. 
that uh, um, people picking each other up, people helping each other, people uh, definitely a sense of play, people playing towards learning. Yeah. And I'm thinking more and more that you know rhizomatics, whatever it is, definitely has a, a play is a, a critical, critically important oh, yes. part of it. Yeah. And that uh, I'm trying to bring play, just generally speaking, I can't even be even more specific about it, trying to bring, bring play into my classroom this semester as a way to try to, I, I still haven't figured out what rhizomatic learning is, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> I, I will try to, try to uh, figure out a way to use it in my classroom pragmatically, because I think that's where, it's funny, this week, I'm beginning to see lots and lots of posts kind of switch towards, okay, it's, a, it's about uncertainty this week, but it's also about how do I use this in yeah. my classroom? How, do I, how does this work out as pedagogy? And I'm beginning to see that more and more. So people are, you know, doing what I'm trying to do in the classroom too this week as my classes start. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about about that part of it, and the, the feel that I'm getting from RISO 14 is the same as I got from CL Mo. I'm, I'm excited to hear you say that because that was certainly the intention with the topic this week. I tried really hard to be very irritating about the first two topics. Um, <laughs> Good job. I, I think I was successful. <laughs> um, so for, for some who might not know those, what were they? Uh, the first one was cheating is learning. <clears throat> Cheating as learning or cheating is learning, depending on who you talk to. Um, I actually purposefully said it both ways just to be additionally annoying. <laughs> um, and what was what was the second one? Oh, I fought. Um, I, um, independent. Power. Oh, enforcing 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 independence. Enforcing independence. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and they were both specifically intended to make people question the power structures that they teach in and that they learn in. <clears throat> Not because the people taking the course don't anyway, but because in order to sort of... I mean, Rhizomatic learning is about freedom, right? It's about the freedom to react and the freedom to be human. And Monica does this, I think, explains this better than anybody, um, whether she's talking about rhizomatic learning or not. But um, that ability to respond to the learning process as we are geared as humans to respond. And the first two sets were very much designed to get people off-center, to push them out a little bit, to make them sort of question the structure. For some people, that was, and actually for a lot of people in this course, questioning the structure was by nature what they do anyway. But there certainly were some, and I think of our, our um, I don't know what to call her, the, the, the master student from the Philippines, who has very much become one of the focal points of the course for me, um, she's in a very traditional, very behaviorist uh, course program at the university she's in. I shouldn't say very behaviorist, smacks of behaviorism. Um, and she's looking at this, taking this course, this at the same time, and it's totally, she's got this weird sort of dissociative problem coming where she comes <laughs> to talk to us and then goes back to talk to her, like her friends in the classroom, and she's like, you know, she's kind of caught in the middle, but her writing ends up being really, really fascinating. So you've got people... Um, who have been doing this for a long time, and people who are brand, brand new to this sort of way of looking at things all together. And the first two were meant to shift, but the third one was very much about trying to start making that that practical move, moving towards next week, which will probably be, depending on how the posts sort of adapt themselves near the end of the week, now I'm starting to get a feeling that we're going to do something that's about focusing on projects, coming, coming down to, to, to individual outcomes both from a teacher's perspective, but also from a student's perspective. So uh, both from a how do you do pedagogical design and also as a learner, how do I think about this? So, uh, I've got a question. Chris, the question is rhizome as metaphor, you know. Um, so <laughs> like, I, I have some irises, and, you know, I, I, I think I know rhizomes. And, and I know that sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work, and I don't want to pin you down too much, but as Go like, ahead. Joe and... Paul and I kind of start to connect our classes, which I, I think is definitely rhizomatically. Um, it makes me wonder um, about things like, well, the things that I've had to do differently in my own little cocoon of a classroom to make it rhizomatic. And, mm -hmm. and at some point, 
um, Dave, I guess I'd like to just hear how, when you look back at all the stuff you've done, um, are there some, like as a gardener, there's some things I do to make sure the rhizomes transfer, you know? Yes. And and are there some things that seem to um, be common? Is that a fair question? Or I mean, um, I can talk about the stuff I've noticed if that helps, but... No, I, I mean, wondering. you can, and I'd be super interested about that. I don't think that'll help me answer the question. I have a feeling you might answer your own question if you did that. Um, but I, I think you already know what's in your head. Why not? I'll take a run at it. And then I'd love to hear your side of it after. Um, I'll say first that my rhizomes experiences from a gardening perspective are mostly desperately negative. Um, my, and I mean that desperately probably less than I actually feel it. Because the two rhizomatic plants I learned on were the bishop's weed and the Japanese knotweed. Um, and if, either, if any of you know either of those plants, the only thing worse than one is the other. <laughs> um, the Japanese knotweed is famous for having, when it was found on the grounds where they were going to be building for the 2012 Olympics in London, you have to dig down 30 feet and 30 feet around it to guarantee that it's not going to grow back. It's been known to go through four inches of asphalt. Um, the thing is indestructible, essentially. Um, and there's something about the resilience and the, and the the way that I see the learning process as a human experience that's very much like that. You can try to shove it under the asphalt, but it's coming. So for me, the gardening end of that comes from that end. I came to the gardening end second, though, because the rhizome metaphor for me is not a gardening one. It's a philosophical one, and it comes from Deleuze and Guattari. So they were very bad botanists and not botanists at all, really. <laughs> there are French philosophers who had heard the word and interpreted it in a very, very specific way. And so from both of those ends, when I look at how I try to do both of those things, both what the Deleuze and Guattari were talking about, not about learning specifically, but about knowledge, which is that if you think of it as tidy, you're making that up <laughs> because it's not. Um, and maybe that's the easiest way to explain the difference. Um, and then if you think it's controllable and you think it's shapeable for one thing for everybody, you're, you're making that up too. And I think that it's, it's, I think of the same way with the rhizome metaphor. If you think you can control that rhizome, you're kind of fooling yourself because it's not like that. You can shape and direct and construct and it, it grows better that way. But that's your job as an educator is to try to do that where I've gotten myself into trouble is almost all along the lines about the things that we're talking about in the first three weeks. Anytime I try to impose a knowledge structure about some things that are true, that's when I screw it up. If you don't empower, as soon as you say, this is true, and if you're not doing this, you're doing it wrong, you're getting yourself into trouble. That's not to say that everything is true and everything is right, but that's the conflict, right? That's, that's the first place you run yourself into trouble. The second one is with independence and you have to to some degree enforce independence as much of a paradox as that is um, because our education system in many of the places it perpetuates itself is re I'm watching my kids fight through it now where they're being structured to be rewarded by doing what they're told rather than by thinking and there's a deconstruction there of enforcing independence to bring people back on board uh, unlearning if you like and then the, to me the next one is the uncertainty piece. It's the same thing. I have to remain uncertain in order for rhizomatic learning to work. They have to read the uncertainty from me as students and then read their own uncertainty as the same and then we need to share from that place of uncertainty. And once we get there and then once we think of ourselves as a, as a group of people who don't really know what's going on moving forward together and slowly getting better together, then we're getting to the right place. As soon as I go, oh, I know how to do that. Don't worry, I'll sort that for you. I've lost it again. You know what I mean? So it's about humility more than anything else, which anybody who knows me and, and, and Paul and I have known each other for a while and stuff, it's a real challenge. Humility is not easy for me. Um, I'm a bad person. Um, but that humility, I think, is maybe the most important piece 
because as teachers, so often we hear people talk about, you know, I don't want to give up power. They don't, you totally have to give it up. The uncertainty is, is at the very heart of making the whole system work because without it, you just create a hierarchy and then the whole thing collapses. You create a dependency relationship with the, with the student and then once you're not there, they don't learn anymore. And that's the opposite of what we're trying to get done. That was a long was diatribe. A <laughs> there was a yeah, long, long thread from a, a post I put in the DL MOOC about messiness, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you would take off, Dave, on that from the point of view of trying to implement this stuff in the real world with actual kids in a classroom, and um, and not just Dave, anybody reflecting on that. Because it, it's, it's such a challenging thing. Everything I've ever done that was really exciting and real mm. was also pretty messy. Yeah. And right at, right at the edge of what I could get away with a lot of the time. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's strange that a lot of technology people end up being some of the people who I think of as innovators with education. Um, and I think, not not by any means that they control that, but that it often happens that those things come in hand in hand. Because for many of us, particularly seven or eight years ago and before, the technology was so shady and so unstable that the, the messiness was part of everything you tried to do. Um, so if you look at, I remember, <laughs> does anybody remember OpenSim? Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a sure. virtual world. It was like it was like Second Life, but it was open source. And mm -hmm. in 2007, we ran this project, and it was this big thing. We built a, the land of Anne of Green Gables inside of OpenSim, and had the kids go inside of it, and they were supposed to interact. And then all they would do was fly around each other, and every time <laughs> fly around each other like this on the edge of one of the Sims, the server would crash. And I just. I still remember standing in the middle of the classroom and going, I'm going to choke that kid over there, I think. No, I can't. I mean, but I can't, but it's not their fault. And you just had this crazy moment where you're like, what am I going to do about this? It's totally falling apart. And then you start to laugh and realize that it's not going to make any difference. It's fine. The kids are having a hilarious time. And they're understanding that this is what trying things is really like. You know, it's not a tidy event. It's not a, oh, here, put this button in here, you know, put the plug into that. Oh, I have the wrong kind of plug. I'll go get the one that fits. It's not like that. It's messy. It's uncertain. And I still remember that as being one of those transitional moments for me where I was like, I'm going to stop these children from doing these bad things to going, oh, shit, they're all having a really good time. And they're all realizing that this is what trying things out is like. And I think as technology people, for me at least, as that was my gateway to a lot of this, I was given way more latitude than somebody who taught math was ever given. Although, again, Monica being the exception to that. Um, so, yeah, messing is so critical. And I think I learned that lesson easily, whereas somebody who had to learn that in an English classroom may have come a lot harder to them, because for me... I still, like, I, I can think of a dozen times where I was in a classroom where, I remember one classroom where I walked in to turn on the computer and I pushed my finger right into the front of the computer and it went all the way into the computer and I skidded the skin all off the top of my finger <laughs> up to the back knuckle because somebody had carved out the back of the computer and ripped all the guts out of it. There was nothing left inside the case. And I taught the rest of the class trying to stop the blood from dripping off the finger <laughs> with no technology and everything I'd planned was gone and stuff, but... I had so many of those things happen because I tried so hard to use the technology early on that that uncertainty became a part of my classroom. So, could, could, could we shift uh, a little bit, um, if you don't mind, Dave? <laughs> and because and, cause I did invite Joe and Chris here to talk a, a little bit about... And, and I'm wondering if we're in a similar kind of place on Youth Voices as you might be in, in the course. In that, you mentioned that the next week might be about getting projects started of some sort. So I'm wondering how you're forming groups or groups are forming or and so forth. And where we are um, is that, you know, on Youth Voices, which, you know, um, 
you helped us uh, get started uh, a good decade ago <laughs> with long. at least a few ideas. Yeah, believe it or not, um, the um, the uh, you know, and Chris, you're Crystal, you're um, more articulate at at this question than I am. I think a little bit. We do a lot of parallel play on Youth Voices. There's a lot of uh, kids posting things and. Have, you know, sometimes they hit each other, sometimes they don't. So it's messy in that way. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good messy. I don't know what that is. But so so we we, but then when we try to control the conversation, say you know you got to respond to this, you got you know that that doesn't work either. So where we are now is is on a Titan pad. Everybody's listed their um, their topics that that they're kind of exploring over time. And we wanted to talk a little bit tonight. So, I'm, tell me if this is wrong. It is totally out of out of whatever. But can you give us a rhizomatic suggestion for next steps on that? And Joe and Chris, do you want to explain what you've come up with so far? Jump in on that. Yeah. Um, Thanks, yeah. Joe, for coming. Yeah, yeah. no worries. Um, I don't know. I feel like I want to just real quick uh, speak to Dave's point. Because I feel ever so validated now as a tech teacher, I'm messy and <laughs> and it's really open ended and, and and that's okay now according to Dave. So I'm good. Thanks. You have um, my permission. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> the metaphor too, we're in the middle of Shakespeare, so that's I'm right there. Thank you. Um, yeah. In order, I guess the the rhizomaciousness. I don't know to add another. Oh, term I like there. that. Um, <laughs> welcome to the English factor. Um, I just wanted to say one one part that I think is also when we said when Chris asked the question about I guess it was leading to kind of like what's what's some of the the through lines or the the common knowledge and then Dave you're saying don't try to put the construct on that but I don't know I feel like there's a part of it that hope part that I I mean if we were to measure the tones of the voices here there's just still a lot of hope in talking about it and then I guess that's pervasive right now um, in our classroom, and it's also springtime, so a lot of them are going to be grad graduating. Um, and so there's this hope part, and so I just that's what we're kind of doing now. I feel is 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 capitalizing on that energy. So, and it's messy, but it's fun. So yeah, on Youth Voices, my kids, uh, Chris's kids, Paul's kids, all looking at hopefully finding common research topics, and ours are around social equity and. We just started looking today and already seeing collaborations. We're kind of at a, okay, what do we do next? How do we how do we make the most of it? Um, but not having crazy expectations, um, just seeing what happens. Uh, so, I don't know, that's yeah, where we are with it. Worth mentioning, a part of this is we're also trying to launch, you know, Youth Voices Live, so that we do some of this work like this that we do on TTT with kids. Mm. So, um, as well. Right, and I mean, so I, I would say that when that happened, uh, the three times we've done it so far where the classes, you know, realize Oakland, Utah, New York, you know, the time zone <laughs> issues yeah. are, are not easy, but uh, we have been able to connect, and um, I didn't know how that would go with my kids because, um, you know, we just threw up this, here, here's this school in Oakland, here are these kids, yeah. and, and here are these kids in New York, let's just talk. Uh, you never know how that's going to go. And so um, my kids, I was really amazed that uh, they really liked it. I mean, they loved it. And and then um, right now on the Titan pad, the idea is, you know, they write their what they're really interested in. And, um, and uh, we don't have any expectations either, and I'm certainly a friend to uncertainty. And um, they... Um, are looking already though for those intersections and I guess my question earlier was I've had to learn a lot of things in kind of a rhizomatic approach um, you know like I had to my curriculum needs to be more transparent so that Joe and Paul kinda of know what I'm up to right. other teachers and, and we're talking about rhizomatic in a traditional school setting you know other teachers have to want to join in and have the opportunity and that kind of thing and we have to communicate and then the students need to connect and they need to communicate and they also need to be really clear about their ideas which is wonderful um, but then the thing that I'm thinking about more and more is about the rhizomaticness is um, 
if we're in these very different places and we have issues that transcend our place, those seem to be ripe areas of collaboration that I'm looking forward to. Like teenagers let loose on global or national issues, I think, can, and there's the hope piece, Joe, yeah, I think yeah. they can do a lot better than my generation is right now. And it's, it's messy, but I have a lot of hope for what they're going to do, and I think they do too. Well, I don't know if, if you mind me jumping in there for a sec. I think one of the big advantages is when you take, I mean, rhizomatic approach, you could call it a lot of things. When you take a, an approach that doesn't necessarily define the outcomes as being content-based, where you, where in a specific sense, is that if you attack a like a, a social issue, the multiplicity of positions is part of the approach, right? Necessarily, when you take it from a rhizomatic perspective. So if you're going to take a like a, a race issue, for instance, you can have 14 different truths all living side by side, as we do in our cultures. Right, that's the that's the problem. When you try to come up with one opinion about it, is when you get yourself into trouble. When you understand the paradoxes of our culture, when you see everybody's perspective as being valid at the same time, um, that's when things start to start to make sense to me. So I think it's it's fantastic. I always think about <clears throat> Paul. Do you remember the conversation? Was it you involved in the one with the kids in Virginia about Halloween? Mm -hmm. It's about ten years ago. Yeah. With mm -hmm. Lee Baber. Yeah where the kids from the small town of Virginia were talking about how they went to their grandma's house for Halloween and the kids from New York City were talking about when asking those kids when they would be egging the houses that night right. and they were appalled thinking well why wouldn't I, I couldn't possibly um, and there was this wonderful conversation that came out of that about the cultural differences between those two those two places yeah and, and the, I think, the the, the rural kids had guns earlier than <laughs> that's that was part of the interesting. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. But that's just it. It wasn't as simple as bad and good and whatever. There's this whole complex pastiche at work here. That is what culture is. And they got a chance to share that back and forth between those two classrooms. And for me as an observer, it really gave me hope in the model that you're talking about, Chris. And that's that, you know, when you open up your work, open up the reasons why you're doing stuff, and you open up to other people who have come from a different place. And again, for me, Rise 014 is like that, right? We've got people from all over the world taking this from their own learning perspectives and whatever, and you open it up that way. You, If you yourself are also open or fight to be so, you can't help but grow through that process. And I think having that opportunity at 12 or 10 or 14, um, that's awesome. Like that's such an opportunity you're giving those kids to to stretch the way that they see the world beyond the the groups that they're sort of associated with locally. I think that's fantastic. I want to introduce Tommy Buteau. Um Did I say your last name correctly there? Yep, that's it, Buteau. Okay, Tommy Buteau. Um who actually has seniors as well. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but both Chris and Joe here have seniors. Um, Great. And and you you finally got your kids on. It was so exciting. Um, yeah. Recently. Um, yeah, I'm glad uh, glad to be back. I wasn't able to uh, um, figure out how to get on uh, last semester. I just didn't have the time because I was teaching a new class and um, sure. it was a little hectic. Um, so I'm so happy to be back uh, this semester with my creative writing class. And I think it'll be a great forum for them, kind of. Uh, similar to what you're talking about, that you know we, we're from Windsor, Colorado, and uh, you know my kids have never put up stuff for kids from New York City to read before, and so even when we were putting up these first letters, it was eye-opening for them to think you know people that are from a whole different world really are going to be reading what I'm writing, and and I look forward to getting in and looking at some of the work that uh, that you've been putting up with my students too, because uh, I know they'll enjoy that. So I'm definitely glad to be back. Very cool. So I don't have a next step here. What do you tell us, <laughs> Dave? Tell us more about um, 
how the projects are going to form. Are you you are you in week week four or what's the idea? I, yeah. I don't even know what a headless project is. So it's, why don't you go I mean, there? A little bit? I'm I'm not quite headless. I'm kind of like a semi visible head. <laughs> like I think. But I don't know. Um, somebody described it in the feedback form. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something terrible. I'm gonna read something to you over this because it just it made me howl so much. Um, the description that one of the actual participants had of my role because question six in my feedback form I asked last week was how do you see the relationship between your role and Dave's role in the course? And my server is still working, so this will come up. Um, so their description is, somehow Dave got into the room without anyone checking his pockets, and there are now frogs jumping around the linoleum and swimming in the punch bowl. <laughs> I pick another frog, and we hop around for a bit. Seriously, Dave seems ethereal and backgroundy, but also attentive like a tour guide. Um, that vaguely describes how I feel about my role in the course, so not quite headless exactly, but uh, certainly... Confusing. Um, we're in week three, um, and as part of week three, we're doing uncertainty. We've got another. We're halfway through the week. Uh, blog posts are coming in now, and then the way this course has been working is that really by the end of the week, I come up with what the next week is going to look like. I had some sense at the beginning of what we would do. I threw that out after the first week entirely. Uh, because the depth of the input that I got from the people in the course was so far and above anything I had any right to expect that it just didn't make any sense to to continue along the track I was going on. So I kept amping up the difficulty level and kept getting, you know, um, people rising and, and sort of giving me responses I never really expected. So the same thing's going to happen with week four is I'm just going to keep pushing it until... Uh, What's an example of that? What's an example of where you ramped it up? Well, I mean, the the enforcing uh, independent stuff was was totally trying to push them to the point where they'd push back and go, "You can't keep asking questions like that," because people complained about the cheating question. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, I would go in and say, "Well, you know, you could push this a little bit further uh, in a couple of places," and then people would look at me and go, "You're not even pushing that far enough." And then they would all get taken over again. And, and I was lucky uh, early on that a week before the course started, some people volunteered um, after some prodding uh, to sort of represent each of the different groups. Because the course lives on P2PU, for those of you who don't know. That's peer-to-peer -peer university. That's a project that's kind of an offshoot of the MIT Media Lab or comes out of some of that group. Um, and it's a shuttle, I think it's Shuttleworth Foundation. Should have got that right. Anyway, foundation funded, um, and but the vast majority of the interaction doesn't actually happen there. Um, it's happening on Facebook. It's happening on Google Plus. It's happening in the Twitter on the Twitter hashtag. It's happening inside of with some of the tools that have come out. There's a Digo group and a, there's all kinds of places that people have taken it, and on people's blogs, which is really great because. Um, Blogging's not where it was five years ago, and it's really great to see, like, I, I know five or six or ten people who've gone back to their blogs for this course, which I find really exciting. Um, some good friends of mine who haven't blogged in a while. Um, and people who are hosting conversations, too, which is also really exciting. Uh, certainly, I think there's a thread on Terry's uh, blog that went down, like, 40 or 50 comments at one point. I don't know how far that got, Terry, but um, where there was a point that Terry made, and people went, Oh yeah, that's a good point. We should dig into that. And then people started going, <laughs> yeah. which is clawing into it. <laughs> well, that's what you want, right? Because that's yeah, that's where the community thing. becomes really important. This is the first time I've ever been able to run a course, and I, I, I about four people about to say something. Uh, last thing, I'll, I'll put my hand on my mouth. <laughs> this is the first time I've been allowed, in the sense that I'm running all by myself. I have nobody to argue with, to run a course <laughs> with absolutely no suggested readings. I have not suggested people read anything. Mm -hmm. I have made no reference to rhizomatic learning. Terry said, I don't know what it is yet. I haven't explained it. I've made no reference to it. I made no pointers to any of it. Essentially, I am totally trusting the people who are there to go out and find the things they need to engage, to learn, and to push the topic 
without any input from me. And all I'm doing is just trying to do this the whole way. And it's it's so much fun. <laughs> Now's your chance. Jump in, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow, Dave, I don't know. Chris, Christine, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. um, did you unmute? I thought you did. Yeah, I did unmute. <laughs> I guess, um, and I don't necessarily want to take the conversation in this direction, if you guys don't <laughs> But want, I'm going to so, anyway. <laughs> but, um, no, I just was thinking, like, I'm, cur I'm always interested in the structures that this stuff hangs mm -hmm. on, right? So, kind of, like, in CL MOOC, we had kind of a, and Terry can talk about this, we had these sort of cycles, these make cycles that would start, you know, in um, with kind of a, a prompt at the beginning of the week to make something. Mm -hmm. And then we had a couple structures like some Twitter chats and a place to share some things, but you could really share anywhere. And then we had, um, you know, opportunities to return to it in various um, places, but, and then a new cycle would start the next week. You know, so we had like, like everybody could expect this sort of structure that would happen and Agreed. it wasn't a fixed structure either but it was kind of cyclical and had an ebb and a flow to it that um, people almost course like kind of get used to but it didn't have we also didn't have readings and we didn't have um, we didn't actually prompt people to we didn't prompt people conceptually at all um, we prompted people to make stuff and share. That, right. That's how sure. each week would start. That's great. And um, and so I just thought it was sort of interesting. And then when I watch Youth Voices, I notice these structures that things kind of, that there are these patterns that you guys that's return to. So I guess more than structures, maybe it's the patterns of the work mm -hmm. and, and what supports the work and keep going and kind of, float along and for things to start to happen. So we don't have to go in that direction, but I'm always curious to hear what people are design how people are designing in that way. Well I will I will make an attempt <clears throat> at an efficient answer. Um, for me it was simple. I announce on Monday night and then do the live event on Thursday, which frankly I'm not sure is actually relevant. And then other than that there's nothing else going on. Um, I'm trying to send something out on Thursday, on Sunday, uh, and I probably will. So from my perspective, just in my mind, I go Monday night, Thursday, Sunday. Yeah, we um, were kind of paced like that too, actually. But that's about it. Practically, I'm kind of futzing around all the time anyway. Yeah. And poking at people and retweeting stuff as as I as I come across it. But the thing with this stuff is that, you know, I work <laughs> a lot anyway. Um, so there's only so much time that I have. So if I run into a bad string of things that have jumped in front of me, I can miss a day. And a course like this, missing a day is like, <sighs> you know, I came back and missed a day two weeks ago and was like, why are all you people fighting? <laughs> what just happened while I was gone? Um so it is, it is kind of weird because it takes on patterns of its own, right? Because yeah. they're just ebbs and flows of human relationship. It's neat. Yeah. So, Dave, how do you keep track of um, all, the, all that's I going don't. on? Okay. I don't. Well, I mean, well, how do you try to? <laughs> or do you try to? Yeah. I figure... I, I take my belief in the Internet that uh, with my, my sort of connections, the things I really need to see will make themselves apparent to me eventually. I have, and I understand that this is sacrilegious. I understand what I'm about to say is a terrible thing to say. I have come to kind of respect the way that Facebook works. <laughs> that really hurt. It hurt to say. But what it does do is it does move the, the bigger conversations to the top. So if you've missed something dramatic, it keeps going up inside of the group structure, which is kind of neat. Uh, and I've never, ever spent this much time inside of Facebook to find this out before. But that's been really helpful. I find that the work that Mark Hoxie has done to make Twitter understandable to a large community is the most impressive thing I've seen in probably five years. I don't know anything about that. Tell me. 
I, um, he, he's been working, later, but yeah, he's been working on the Tags Explorer project for three or four years now. Um, and I've tried to use it a half dozen times, and it's always been like too technologically not helpful. Um, but he's finally got the UI on it so that it works out. So essentially there's three or four ways to look at it. But you can get a giant tag cloud of everybody who's used the hashtag and all the connections between those people. So you can go around and cherry pick the people who don't have connections yet. Now some of those people are going to be companies and whatever, but really close to the point where you can actually find people who are not connected and connect them and find people who are super connectors and reward them and all these kinds of things that are so important with social network analysis. Um, you've got the other way of looking at it, which is sort of the highlights view, which allows you to, to see the sort of themes that are developing out of what's going on and sort of look at it from the top end and sort of flip through it. And it's, I can do a screen share here. Let me take you, I don't know, my computer's a bit wobbly. Do you mind, do you want to see? Sure. Because I can do that. Yeah. And as you're talking, and I, I and we're, we are getting a little techy right at the end here, but, and that's fine. <laughs> Um, the, the other kind of technology that um, Philip Schmidt... Um, oh, on Hangout. Yeah, on Hangout, that we, I, we were starting to think about experimenting with, too. So, I'm ima so one of the things, Joe and Chris, that I can imagine is that, you know, we could pull a couple... Uh, bringing two classes together, right, is, like, nice... But then th there are going to be two or three who want to go talk, and they should go off on their own Hangout. And, and so the unhangout is a possible, possible way of, of accomplishing that. But you've, you've tried to use it as Twice. well? Twice. Uh-huh. And how'd it go? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm interrupting your other demonstration here. But no, no, that's fine. Yeah. It's, not, it's not for the week of... Uh, huh. Yeah, it's... Um, I... You've done 5,000 webcasts at this point, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not going to be a problem for you. Um, it's a, there's a lot going on, and it's not very easy to control. And for me to say that, not very easy to control, <laughs> that's... Um, so the breakout groups work seamlessly. It just essentially is a way of bringing five or six hangouts together, or a hundred, I guess. You could explain it as far as you want. Um, it is very difficult to move between things elegantly. Um, and I think given maybe more smart people thinking about it, um, you could come up with some models that would make it effective as a tool. Um, but the potential's there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I find it destabilizing to my ability to talk, which I think is really interesting. So anything that makes me kind of go, I can't do what I normally do here, I kind of get excited about it. And it certainly does that to me, I can tell you that. I don't think that was a very good description. Right. Yeah, I, look, it's, um, it's, a, it's something to play with and see how it works. I think that's... Yeah, really, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, one, of, one of the deal breakers for me is that the breakout rooms... I'm deal breaker. But one of the things I... Let's rephrase that. One of the things I hope they get too fast is um, that the breakout rooms get recorded too. That seemed right. like kind of important to me. But, yeah, 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 there, yeah. Is, there a, is there a way that we could we could make that happen for real? Because that, that's, that's kind of the kicker right there. I mean, can a kid get on a, their phone on FaceTime even with another kid? I feel like, Chris, some of your kids might be even better resourced than mine, and I'm surprised at the resources mine have to just take their devices and go do those. I mean, what's, what's, what's the likelihood that I can get, you know, kids sitting under trees doing their Google Hangout in Oakland talking to your kids in Utah? Easy, easy. That's yeah, what I, I mean. I feel like it's easy, and I feel like it's difficult and logistically in some ways, but I feel like, I, I don't know. It's it's easier than we think. Maybe I'm really deluded, but I'm on that Dave tip of, I don't know. I feel like we have enough skill set between the bunch of us to put it together. I don't know. Right. Finding it the is, topic and finding the time, I say. It is about time zone 
<laughs> Which, yeah, yeah, the time zone. Time that's that's the part where the kids. It's cool. You know, the, your kids will stay up late to talk to my kids on their own time, and they'll arrange it <laughs> if we like open the door. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I love your trust of that. That's great. I totally yeah, trust I, that. Why not? I think so too. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And and Tommy, can I can I just say that um, like you. So, like the the letters your kids wrote, and they wrote letters about things they carried, and it's, I think some of yep. them are featured right now still. The the one about the 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 young woman who lost her father, or her father's in jail. Uh, uh, that one that one was uh, pretty pretty amazing. Powerful, yeah. Yeah, but but some of the other ones, pretty pretty interesting writers you've got there. Um, yeah, it's it's a good group. I had them all last semester. Uh, well, not all uh, of them. There's a few new ones, but uh, so Joe I have a, too, already. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I have a good uh, relationship with them, so they're, uh, you know, they've already worked with it and they've already started sharing a lot of stuff. So I'm hoping to get really good stuff this semester. But can I just and and this is uh, I'm just going to put this out there as uh, and and it's a sloppy ending and that's fine um, as we're getting there. But but I'm totally like you sent me an email, Tommy, um, and said uh, you know here are, here are the six projects that we're going to do and and that was really cool to kind of see. Um, uh-huh. But that but then I was wondering, okay, then how do we? Like get together, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what's always interesting. Like getting transparent about our curriculum, like Chris Sloan said earlier, is is really important, and I think that's cool. But then, wouldn't it be interesting if we could do something MOOC like or course like across our different classes? Yeah. Even even when you were talking earlier, I was starting to kind of think, well, how could I incorporate this rhizomatic learning into, because uh, creative writing, it seems like it'd be a perfect fit for that, um, you know, and, and I don't, I haven't studied a lot about um, the whole concept, but it just seems like almost if you can provide a topic um, and let students do whatever they want with it, that you could bring it all together in that way, um, you know, so kind of give more freedom or give more control to the students as a way to, um, you know, bring, uh, bring the, you know, a culture in New York and a culture in uh, Oakland and a culture in Colorado all onto the same platform or kind of circulating around the same topic at least might, uh, might be a way to bring it in. Hey, Tommy, can I propose something really fast before we all sure. go? Yeah. Um, do you think I start my Shakespeare unit on Monday? I've got mm-hmm. um, Othello with my senior English regulars and my uh, Hamlet with my AP. Do you think if I if I shot you a bunch of the themes that if you had any kids that had written pieces thematically that might fit that we could do a share share somehow on? Sure. Yeah, that'd something? be great. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Definitely, because uh, if if it's a theme, then that I could definitely arrange a topic around the they're, theme. They're yeah. they're building props for well, that's our entrance into the play is the building of props. So it's uh-huh. all like kinesthetic. I don't know. It's a big. But they're big, actually physically building the props. Yeah, we're building cr- props out of recycled crap, and then we're gonna post those on on YV. Nice, nice. We'd love great. to get some feedback from people on our recycled crap props. <laughs> it's like Survivor meets Survivor meets like. Where are you like gonna post it, Joe? I'd I'm gonna I'm gonna post it. I'm gonna put it on on Youth Voice. I I promised myself that this spring they would post more of of their creative pieces. So like Tommy was uh, what Tommy's kids would already be doing. It's where they're posting that kind of work, the soul kind of work. So I don't know. That's where we're gonna put it, and then I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm, I told them to be ready to be, you know. We need a, re- a recycled craft channel. Sorry. Can you can you get one of those going? Yeah. Recycled crap channel in Shakespeare. It's, it's gonna be great. Love it. So. Uh, okay, so so sometimes we go around and get final thoughts, but I'm gonna call it final provocations because that's what I think we are here. Um, so and we'll end with you, Dave, if you don't mind. Uh, so Terry, any thoughts here or any provocations or whatever you want to say here? Um, I just want to finish. <laughs> you know, there's. I work with university students, and uh, I've gotten some great ideas tonight here about uh, groups. And I've not really considered using my whole class as a as a group, although that's where I'm moving. And I've got D plus, uh, Google Plus communities for my for uh, my junior level composition class. And I'm thinking, well, maybe we could have a 
we could have two projects going, individual projects, and then a group project that uh, would that everybody would contribute to. So uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Cool. Fred, nice to see well, you again. <laughs> yeah, it's great to it's great to check in and hear this. I I really appreciate the opportunity, um, and the the. I was just thinking about deconstructing the classroom as MOOC. If you sort of reverse analogize, one of the things that was wonderful for me about the CL MOOC and that I've continued on my own initiative is of having a physical face-to-face -face group that was part of the MOOC. We, we were one of only three in California, I think, who had an ongoing face-to-face -face group during the CL MOOC. And I've continued it as just a drop-in monthly session at the Arts Council um, offices as a way to keep that connection going. So a classroom is kind of a, a built-in face-to-face group, and the MOOC part is the connection with other classrooms. And, and that's what you guys are managing, and in transparentizing your curriculum is creating those collaborative prompts and, and the, the, the nurturing environment of the collaboration cross-classroom to, to where everybody feels safe and, and shares deeply. Um, so I think it's wonderful. I want to just throw out two little things that I've been doing. Yesterday I did the first of a series of workshops at the public library in Watsonville on using genealogical research as a basis for telling family stories. And I'm planning a workshop for both teachers and community members from a session I went to in Berkeley with Paul O around illuminating the notebook, making a, 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 a little sort of jerry rig uh, copper circuit on a notebook page so you have a, a, a uh, a flashing light or a series of lights or whatever that so you bring in programming and uh, they, they call it um, what is it? It's connecting the notebook um, and it's a wonderful opportunity which I will write something up about soon I hope I gotta start plugging out this workshop very cool thank you for sharing all that Christina, do you want to mention uh, next week we're doing <laughs> so a show. We're getting the invitations out around uh, Digital Learning Day. Is that what it is? Yes, yes, and yes. You so, can say something else, too, if you wanted to. But. Okay. <laughs> um, well, let me just say that um, I liked your metaphor or how you described the MOOC and the um, connections to face-to-face -to -face work and then all the connections mm -hmm. that are happening um, online, Fred. Um, thought that was nicely said, nicely described. And um, I'm really excited to see um, what Youth Voices does with this work too and how it starts to make build those threads and also the support and the threads that go out. So it's pretty cool. Um, Digital Learning Day is next week and um, we are um, actually the Alliance for, um, well, that's hosting the Alliance for Excellence in Education, but we've been working through the Ed Innovator Project with the After School Alliance, and um, we've um, thrown out an idea about Make for Digital Learning Day with them. So again, it's a prompt to make things to share them, to celebrate digital learning, and um, so whether, and there's some prompts online, I could share the, the link to it, um, for some suggested banks if you want to make those, some of them come from the Make Bank this summer that we collected, um, and then, um, or you can make anything you really want, analog or digital, and just share it in a um, digital space so we can all can see it. and. Um, a bunch of folks who were playing around like that on next Wednesday will be gathering here on Teachers, Teachers, Teaching Teachers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting Something tired. Like that. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> no, thank you. That was that was a great summer. Chris Sloan, you have any last thoughts? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, for all my talk of transparency, I realize, <laughs> like, not maybe I'm 
opaque or something because like when Joe mentioned her Shakespeare unit it's like darn I'm in a research unit right now and my Shakespeare unit is gonna come after that in about <laughs> you know about a month and a week from now right it is and, an asynchronous environment you know guys. R well right 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 and then um, I'm getting to a point and then uh, Tommy oh, like sorry. I think you're reading the things they carried is that right maybe it seems like it. Uh, actually, no. We're just okay. uh, all of my students are reading different books. I just did a, a writing prompt based on the things they carried. Okay. Um, so, so we listen to that first intro. So, so let's just say, uh, like, there's times when my students are reading a lot of uh, creative nonfiction too, and um, I think I have like parallel curriculum right now, and because we were just talking about circuits, and and I think like if we were to line up stuff ahead of time. And Joe, I didn't know you in the beginning of the school year, but now I feel like, you know, you're a pretty good collaborator. Um, what would happen if people were doing similar types of things throughout the year and then the discussions that take place in Youth Voices? It doesn't have to be a common curriculum, but, you know, similar things. Like, my photo class just did DIY, make your own photo gear, and, um, you know, then we're talking about making stuff. And so, there's so many points of intersection, but again, it, I feel like uh, I need to be transparent in a much more public way. So, working on it. Very cool. So, Dave, there you go. <laughs> last thoughts or last provocations? Are we trying to control this thing too much? Maybe we are. But anyway, what it's do you getting think? late here. Yeah, um, I know. We can quit. <laughs> but, oh no! It's hey, you know me. Um, <laughs> any chance to talk? Um, I think that it's imperative that we commit to these exact projects. I am so unbelievably tired of hearing people talk about how the internet is a place full of thugs and weirdos and people who do not interact in ways that are acceptable and seeing those same people who are complaining not engage. And every time I see somebody, I hear of somebody who is engaging in a project that is about having people be good human beings anywhere, but in this case on the internet, I think we've got to continue to support them. It's not as cool as it was a couple of years ago. It doesn't get the funding it used to in the same way. I think the, the work is just as important, if not more so now. And uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's such an important work that people see those little points of light out there as real human beings and every time a kid comes across another person who's from far away who they don't know and is not part of their personal circle and starts to see them as a human being I I don't think there's better work out there to be doing so all I have to say is that uh, I think you guys are doing awesome work you are too so thank you for connecting up again tonight we um, we always thank you right now Dave so <laughs> as the founder of EdTech Talk and with Jeff Lebo, so we can do that uh, kind of personally, and um, welcome you all back next week. Thank you all for having this conversation with us tonight, and Thank we'll see you, you Paul. next week. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for inviting me, Paul. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Good to everyone. see you guys. Good.